Hi, uh, I'm uh, Brendan Wheel. I'm a principal architect at uh, CSG. Um, I've been doing software development, architecture kind of stuff for about 20 years, right? Uh, tw 20 years, and you know, pr primarily about 18 years, I've done only software. And the last year and a half or two years, I've been focused. You know, when we did this DevOps merger, uh, focused more on the ops side of things, mainly you know, the big IP, which is more of the front end, uh, you know, side of the company. So this journey that I'm going to present is, was kind of new to me, and we were trying to figure this stuff out, um, you know, as we go along. Uh, we had tons of good people uh, working in the right place at the right time, um, you know, and uh, so it's, uh, so it's, I hope you find this uh, interesting. Uh, so um, just before I start on this, um, how many people are familiar with, with big IP or just load balancers? All right, quite a few, so awesome. Um, so um, this, is, this is focused towards big, uh, big IP. The, the, the second half is going to be focused towards some of our uh, 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 you know, different, kind of, uh, different kind of pipelines. I'm going to present our pipeline here. Uh, mainly you know, focus on like, the journey, and maybe we'll ask, uh, you can ask uh, questions later on. So, um, and we'll leave some time, actually, for questions. So, the, um, uh, so big IP. So 2007, around, we just want to show you the timeline. In 2007, we had just about four production big IP devices, two developing units, uh, just four ops team members. Those, that team members you know, kept on fluctuating. Uh, they just did ops uh, while we were all in, uh, you know, uh, uh, in software you know, building our products. 2015 now, we have 26 production big IP devices, uh, nine developing units, 11 devices outside of the US, you know, Singapore, Woking. Uh, and again, you can see we had four team members then. We grew and we have two team members. We had two team members in 2015. So when the DevOps team merged, actually, uh, the part of my team merged along with these two team members who were the key team members here uh, from the big IP uh, perspective. They knew a lot about big IP. We knew a lot about software. So when we merged, it's, it's like the, you know, a, good, a good balance between ops and dev, uh, but there were a lot of challenges, right? So when we set into place, the, one of the main reasons for getting these two you know, good teams in place is to, is to, uh, was to, you know, we had to set some goals, like what, what are our main goals for this team going to be? Uh, we were having a lot of outages, a lot of stabilization uh, issues uh, at the time. So we said the, one of the main things was less outages, seamless deploy, deployments, nothing, try at least not to do a lot of manual intervention because when you do uh, go about doing manual, uh, manual stuff, you're going to make mistakes, especially when you're, uh, uh, you know, your time for deployment is like at 11, 11 p.m. every night. Uh, we can't do deployments in the day. Uh, the customers don't want us, uh, don't want to take even a minute outage. Um, we had problems with roles and responsibilities. At the time, Big IP was, you know, open to pretty much most people who wanted to do because there was a scalability issue. Uh, so uh, anyone could go in and do anything on the Big IP device. Now you could, if people know, you could. Big IP is mainly routing. You could go in there and if you click the wrong pool or click the wrong node or whatever, you could take traffic down for that, uh, uh, you know, for, for that, for another team. Um, then there was, the, we, we said we want to do everything self-service. We had scalability issues, so how do we not have too much work to do so that we can put in some automation, put in some CI, CD processes. The only way is we couldn't go and hire, you know, you know, triple the size of the team, but we could get people to do at least work on their side. So we, we said, okay, we'll, we'll, ha we'll have a goal of at least self-service. People can self-service themselves and, and do it a lot themselves. Um, obviously, coming from the, from the uh, software background, uh, the ops side did not have any kind of CI and testing. We wanted to get there. We knew it was going to be hard, but we wanted to get there, right? Um, and then uh, remove the big IP team as the bottleneck. I mean, the main problem that we faced was the big IP team, you know, got requests from the entire company. We hosted endpoints from the entire company, and if anything went down, you know, it doesn't matter if your product is, you know, five nines uh, has a five nine uptime. If the big IP is down, your your product is pretty much down. So uh, if you remove the bottleneck and do some of the stuff, we said we'll, be, you know. Uh, meet our main goal, which is the stabilization. So the first thing we want to tackle is okay. Let's you know let let's go down the path where uh, where everyone has uh, uh, our back, our roles and responsibilities, and and make sure that each product can uh, can only do their stuff, right? So uh, please, please just, um, some of the stuff I'm going to go a little quicker uh, to get so that you know you guys get a good view of the journey. Um, so um, we had problems with uh, with roles and responsibilities. Um, uh, ad hoc haps, groups user access, users can make changes. Um, 
we came up with a solution where, first of all, we said, you know, we had, we, CSG as a company for our software pipeline already had really good CI and CS uh, processes. Um, when I joined the company five years ago, I thought CSG was a leader then um, with a lot of the CI CS processes. The problem is it's really hard to put those processes in into an ops team, which is, this is a DevOps team, but I think it's more ops focused than dev focused from a big IP perspective. Probably you know 60% ops, even more maybe. So um, what you want to do is we wanted to use, we, we didn't want to build a UI, we didn't want a UI team, and we knew Jenkins well, so we said we'll use Jenkins as an automation orchestration tool. Uh, Jenkins integration, use Jenkins with integration with AD, and then derive that information, then map it to our product set uh, to give some roles and responsibilities. Uh, so we came, came up with our own, our own homegrown mapping, uh, and then we said we, we were really good at .NET, so we built the automation framework in .NET, uh, triggered by Groovy in, in Jenkins. Uh, and then to communicate with the big IP, uh, we said we'll, we'll, you know, we'll use uh, the remote APIs, uh, SOAP and REST. Now the main thing out of this is that the reason we are doing some of this is to increase bandwidth so that we had enough people so that we could get to the real good stuff, which is you know, continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, and uh, accountability, uh, auditing, telemetry, and, and stuff like that, right? So one of the first, first jobs, like I, I think uh, I've been with this team for about 18 months right now. One of the first things we did after putting the R back in place was using Jenkins, and um, uh, I'll have a, have a quick demo for all the stuff at the end to see this in action, how we use put Jenkins for our entire pipeline. To, to just do the simple stuff, right? Be able to turn off pools and nodes, but with complete roles and responsibilities in place that we built that's not available on the, uh, on the F5 device uh, today. Uh, there are ways to do that, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not built for that, and we wanted to build, every product has the ability to go out and build, uh, uh, do only work on their set of pools, their set of nodes, and stuff like that. So um, the second part of our presentation will focus on the uh, telemetry tool that we call StatHub. But anything that we do, we push out to StatHub. And StatHub is a tool that actually will show you the real-time data going in. One of the ways we use it is that anything that we do through automation, CI, CD, and whatnot, will be recorded in our live telemetry tool that we can go in and we can search for uh, the word big IP. And you can actually see who's doing work at what time and turning off which nodes and all that stuff. The logging is available on your, uh, uh, on your say, load balancers today, but they're going to be in logs on Unix machines somewhere, and depending on how many machines you have, they're scattered all over the place, right? We have one place to record all that, uh, all that good stuff. Um, so again, this is again the homegrown telemetry tooling stat hub. Uh, we'll talk about you know, a little bit later about this. Uh, but this, again, you can see over here, it records, it records who did what at what time on what device, um, and so you can go in and you can, you can check tomorrow what happened. And we store this for the logging, at least, piece of it we store for a year. Uh, the next thing was syncing devices. Uh, again, if anyone knows uh, and, uh, you know, the HA side of, uh, uh, of Big IP, uh, you have to do your work on one device and then you've got to sync it. That was an issue. Uh, and it was really confusing from, from a dev side of things as to you know, when we should do what, how do we know it's safe to sync and stuff like that. So we built. Again, uh, automation around that. Um, to reduce risk, the Jenkins job, or the GUI that we built in front of the Jenkins, uh, automatically picked which devices um, uh, were, were active. It will show you the diff between the devices. Uh, you can do stuff in mock or pretend mode. And, uh, um, and we, we went with some of the known uh, recommendations from the big IP and set them as default. Again, this is all to reduce risk. and give us more bandwidth so that we can, um, we can focus later on on uh, CI um, and CD. So again, this is a sync job. Not a so one of the main things that when we all joined, so this team was, this team was a, a team of two people that was heavily op focused. Work came in, they got the work done, uh, you know, put it on in production. Um, obviously at the time, most of the stuff was not, uh, was not put in, even into subversion, right, the, the device, we had an HA pair, and everything that we relied on was the HA, the high availability between the active and the standby. And uh, nothing was in SVN, uh, you know, so we didn't have any traceability and stuff like that. So also the other problem was the scope, right? The, the scope of big IP is too large. When I joined the team first, coming from a software background, like I asked the folks, like, 
Do we have something like a class diagram? You know, I, I want to see what the boundaries of this, this whole, uh, uh, the big IP uh, is. And we were told like, no, I mean, you know, we can explain at a high level, like these are the input devices, these are the output devices, these are f in a customer facing, these are not. But how do we know the impact? When we, when we have something that needs to be deployed, how do we know which teams are uh, going to be impacted? So we had this problem of finding out what the impact analysis was in a definite manner so that people who even didn't know the big IP would, could go out to reports and then look at it uh, and then find out, um, uh, you know, do that research themselves in order to create our um, request, um, you know, CRQs that we call it. Um, so many few people understand, as I said, not sure which products pools are on which devices. We didn't even know that. Difficult to get responsible parties involved on the production calls to do validation. Too many devices, as you saw before, uh, and need to do mul log on to multiple devices, you know, to do to do research uh, and all that stuff. So it got really hectic in the night. I mean, at 11 p.m., our Windows 11 to 1, uh, pretty hectic, right? So we came up with. We said the next thing we got to tackle is uh, is come up with our reporting system. So we probably spent I don't know maybe a month or a month a month or two months writing all these reports, which was then published to Confluence so that uh, our product managers, scrum masters, everyone could go out there and do, uh, and do their own uh, uh, research. Because you can go out, if anyone's used the Atlassian suite of products, you can go out there to Confluence, you can search for pools, nodes, and somebody told you, what's this IP address? And if anyone's worked with like, IPs, I mean, I, I can't remember all the subnets and the IPs, but if someone told me this is used where on which device, you could go in there and actually search in Confluence and, and, and look at it, right? So again, a few screenshots of the reports. Um, but again, this is all this is a screenshot from Confluence. So what we did was also we we actually went out to the devices, used their APIs to get down all the information, uh, and then uh, convert them into tables and publish them to Confluence. So with Confluence, you can also see the history. So if anything changed, you can actually go back in Confluence and actually see what changed on the device. So that's another neat feature uh, that you can use Confluence. Uh, at. Uh, also, live traffic. We had another problem of the, the traffic coming into the devices. How do you know uh, what, what are the different routes the traffic is going to take? So uh, this was also used for impact analysis um, um, you know, to help us with this whole, um, this whole transition. Uh, so again, you could go out there. And we actually um, tagged into the riverbed devices, uh, used, used the information on the big IP through to the, to the riverbed devices, uh, and then got the information to find out which which virtual server uh, is actually tied to which server DNS and which client DNS coming in from the client side. So four months in, you know, we are, we're still new to DevOps. Uh, the DevOps team is performing their own, uh, the other. So um, when Erica mentioned that we, we had this DevOps reorg, the, this happened across the company. So not only did we do the DevOps reorg, the, every other team that did even software did this DevOps reorg. But at that time, they were also going through the same journey and learning themselves while we were trying to you know, transform our team and you know, get it a little more organized. So the DevOps teams here is, is our, our consumers, the, the DevOps teams that actually are, uh, that go through the, the big IP. So the DevOps teams are now performing their own pools and nodes syncing. So big IP team, again, as you can see, getting a little more bandwidth to, uh, uh, to do the work that we, we really need to do. Uh, the big IP DevOps team, at least the dev side of people, now have better knowledge because I can go out to Confluence. I can, uh, I can, I can do work on the devices with confidence. Uh, our project managers, uh, a scrum master, can easily find information on the big IP and analyze the change themselves and not depend on the SMEs for uh, you know, every single request and emails that come in. And you know, we get lots of email. So, uh, Action by teams are traceable, accountable, uh, because of the Stat Hub tool that we have for telemetry. Uh, again, no more group users on the big IP devices. That's a PCI risk. So removing that means um, um, uh, I can, uh, you have definite users on the, on the big IP, and those users are known. Uh, you know, and uh, so that, again, uh, that removes another PCI uh, scope risk there. Uh, the next big issue was uh, to to, uh, to be able to reduce some of the risk and also be able to do certain things that, we, that took us a long time uh, uh, with, uh, 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 with certs. So the, the, the problem with certs is that this, we have too many certs, right? And some of them are internal, some of them are, are semantic. Uh, I learned some of the few things the hard way <laughs> that you can't take down a cert. You take down the cert, you're taking down you know, you're, 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 you're taking down a lot, of the, a lot of the traffic, right? You have to be really, really careful 
learn, I learned a lot about search. I took on this task of, of you know, trying to uh, uh, solve it with automation. Uh, and w what happened was I, I, we were pairing with our ops team at night and seeing how much time it took to do a single cert renewal. A single cert renewal on a load balancer device that sits on the front end could take up to 10 minutes. And we are renewing uh, probably 20 to 50 certs, you know, you know, depending on which certs are on which devices for that night, right? So it could take the entire time. Sometimes we are like, OK, it's 11 to 1, and you may hit the end of the window. What about the other work that needs to get done? Uh, so um, we came up with a search solution integration with Symantec to get all that stuff done. Uh, if you need more information, uh, we can definitely talk later. But basically, automation of search was, uh, you know, was, a, was a key thing. So again, this is a search management job that we, that we build automatically with one click. You can do a batch search. Uh, you, know, you can put 50 certs out there. You can specify the units if anyone you know, cares for that or whatever. Um, and you can renew the search. And you don't have to worry about, you know, there's no downtime, and, it's, uh, and you get a report at the end. So this is a report that gets printed. We used to print this every day. Now we do it probably every week. Uh, but shows us even the upcoming search, because it's easy to miss. Not all certs expire at the same time, right? So uh, we also had stabilization issues. And as you saw, the very first thing was, was getting the big IP and all the people um, you know, getting more confidence in our, some of our work procedures and the devices and whatnot. So um, uh, the other thing was not seeing the runtime data and seeing how things like memory and CPU and everything was changing uh, because we had too many devices. So again, another one of these uh, reports that we use still today to look at how, these, uh, how the devices are changing or suddenly a device has an issue and it actually swaps from active to standby. Well, not all teams build their products in a way where if the connection's dropped, it's going, to get, you know, it's going to get mirrored automatically, and then we get called the next day. So we need to figure out the next day as to why that happened. So this, some of these things are so important, and we learned a lot as to the behavior of these devices um, based on that. So eight months in, uh, the DevOps teams are using more of our DIY self-service uh, automation tools. We have better impact analysis. Uh, complete automated cert management, and then control and monitoring of our memory. And all this equated to less outages, so meaning we are trying, we are still, we are close to achieving our goal of being more stable, right? But, but we're not in the wood yet, uh, woods, uh, yet, right? The product, if anyone has worked on the big IP, you know, some folks said we had, you know, we worked on the big IP, was that we typically, people know that big IP or any load balancer consists of servers that is a part of a pool, and most people know, OK, we'll just round robin between the pool and, uh, you know, and, and do that kind of stuff. Well, that's all I probably knew when I joined this team. But, but what's, what's more important is that, is, is that the big IP is probably one of the, you know, the, has the biggest market share with, in terms of load balancers out there, has most feature functionality. There are various lightweight ones out there. Like you can do, I guess, load balancing even with IIS if you wanted to. Um, but it has the most features. So we do a lot with that. We do web application firewall. We do SSL offloading. Um, uh, it's a full proxy, so um, uh, we can monitor traffic going through it. Uh, we can switch. If anyone does blue-green deployments, we do kind of blue-green deployments uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with that, which also you know, um, uh, helps with all our agile and uh, DevOps kind of uh, fundamentals. Uh, so the main problem was that all these uh, we had thousands and thousands of resources or uh, entities out there, um, pools, nodes, and whatnot. But we didn't know which pools and nodes are on which uh, device. So that's where the whole CI actually kind of CI and CD kind of started. Is that first thing we said we wanted Big IP to be similar to any other application like we have. Like if you are a Java developer, you don't just go out there and throw class files on the web server, right? You want it to be in a jar, a war, ear. If you're a .NET developer, you want it to be inside a DLL and EXE, and you want one click install and push that out there. How it get, gets built is usually through a CI process. But um, we, we were never, not close to that. So we found out what is the best way to do that. And luckily for us, F5 had a, had a bundling scheme called an IAP. Um, so we, we said, OK, that's the next thing that we have to do. We have to get everything, all the different products bundled so that we can push them out with a click of a button. So uh, we, had, we, we knew that we had IApps out there, but it was a 
it was nowhere close to where we needed to be. Um, so th because of that, we had lots of manual intervention again. Deployments were taking a, lot of, uh, a long time. And it's risky to move from non-IAPs to IAP because when, the, when you touch the big IP device, you are actually, you're actually, you have to do it in a way where you do not take down traffic. Even though you are doing it in the window, there are still people accessing devices at night. Our customers are using these, um, you know, even, even in night, Charter, Comcast, Dish, and all these customers. So they don't want, don't want any outage. So it's, it's not as easy as trying to switch something because, um, you know, because it's, uh, you're, you're dealing with IP addresses and, and stuff like that. So we said the first thing is let's get to the push towards IAPs, then figure out how to you know, push, push the IAPs applications out and not have any kind of downtime. So uh, we said these are the tenets. All applications should move to IAPs. All apps will be standardized, similar to our development practices uh, in .NET and Java uh, and um, you know, a few others in the company. Uh, IAPs need to be versioned. So that's, that's the key for CI. You need to have versioning because you need to know what version is the stable version and what version needs to get out there and then if you have a problem, what version you need to roll back, right? Uh, people who do any kind of CI know that, that you will look, go out to a DLL and you'll you know, right click, look at the properties and say, okay, this is the version uh, that needs to be out there um, uh, or, or this is the right version or wrong version and depending on if you do you know, trunk-based development and deploy from a branch, you have a, typically a production branch and a, and a, and a trunk branch and, uh, you want to be deploying from production, stuff like that. So, um, um, and IAPS deployment needs to be automated. We said, okay, that's the key because we want to be able to push it and then roll back. Uh, and then you need uh, a strategy to, to, be, to verify that the IAP as an application is actually, um, you know, correct, as actually like compiled. You don't have a way with the big IP because if you go to any kind of load balancer device, everyone has their kind of own, they have their own DSL. Um, you know, and Big IP has, the, they have their own DSL in terms of the presentation layer. Uh, they use a language called TCL to do, their, uh, to do some of their runtime uh, work. So, um, so again, this is some details. I won't go, to, go through this a lot because not all of you might be familiar with this. Um, come and talk to me after if you need any more information. But um, the process for IAP uh, development was that you build a template. And if anyone's familiar with Chef, People familiar with Chef? Um, uh, you, you know, you build like a recipe. So think of template as a recipe. Uh, you check that recipe into the repository, and then you build a service instance, which is like you know, you know the attributes that you change for a recipe, um, and then check that into a repository. We build it, put it through our pipeline, uh, we validate it, and we stamp it with a build number, right? And then, uh, then that template and the instance is ready for deployment. So say we are, we generally have a naming scheme of we are in 2017, third quarter or fourth quarter, so our build number starts from 173001. Uh, every time we push a change out here, our DLLs and say jar files get version bumped, and so does our IAPs also now get, have a boundary, have a packaging scheme, and that gets bumped. So taking a step further, we, we put the CI and self-service with DevOps team across the company. So we daily, we staged all these IAPs to staging devices. Uh, one of the main challenges with Big IP in terms of unit testing and, and smoke testing is like un, unlike other software, you just cannot host those IPs somewhere else because they'll start ARPing and start taking traffic, right? So, so that's, that's one of the main challenges we face. We looked at a lot of unit testing tools, a lot of smoke testing tools out there, but it's very hard to, to mock that kind of data because, um, because you're actually messing around with IP addresses and, you know, it's how do you test this configuration uh, in a vacuum? That's, it's really hard to do. So, uh, but what we, what we wanted to do was make sure that at least the code compiled, so to speak, um, uh, and, and also verified, and then also put it on a staging device that's blocked out from, uh, f uh, you know, from our LAN, uh, so it has no, basically has no VLANs, and then uh, the other teams can go and make changes, stage it, go through the CI pipeline, and then push it out uh, you know, during your uh, maintenance window. So that's what this is basically. So we came up with this IAP service export and, and check-in is that whenever we, we make a change on the staging device, you could go out, use a Jenkins job to check out and check it in based on um, your, uh, you know, use our credentials, but use the, use the team's 
uh, Jira task number in this case and check it into uh, our repository so that it gets built, uh, stamped, um, and then ready for deployment that night. Uh, so with that, we integrated our whole, uh, so these are all the Jenkins job we have. Now we have, we do have a lot of Jenkins job because the team that got merged is actually the framework team along with the, uh, the, the big IP team. But the ones that I've highlighted, you can see the, uh, the infraring IAC, actually IAC stands for infrastructure as code. Uh, we have branched versions for 17.3, which is our production branch, 17.4, which is our trunk. And then you have all these verification jobs. So if the big IP team or anybody from the other teams checked in code that broke something, it would get automatically pushed out to the staging devices. We would know that there's a fault there or there's an IP collision or something like that. And we would be able to catch these preliminary static errors, so to speak. Um, we still have a problem with runtime checking and, uh, and stuff like uh, that, but at least we can catch maybe 40% of the issues up front. And then the last part is that after everything is done, we still needed a way to push it out. So you can do that with Chef. You can run it. Uh, you can you can you can push out a Chef recipe using you know Chef Server and Chef Automate and stuff like that. We didn't have the luxury to do it with Chef. Uh, we had looked into Chef. Actually, Chef doesn't work really really well with the uh, with the big IP. And ultimately, even if we did it, the Chef recipes that were out there actually worked with the SOAP APIs. And actually, the SOAP APIs are deprecated. So we had, we moved from SOAP to REST uh, using talking to the big IP. So. Uh, we didn't have, again, the luxury of Chef, so we push out this uh, deployment using, again, using Jenkins. Uh, and right here, you can see, we can pick the right release. You can pick the build number that you knew had your changes in. Pick the right device. It automatically will select the active device for you. You can pick the product. It will show you the list of apps available for the product, and then you, and then you push it out. If you have a problem, all you got to do is go back and change it from the old, the, old uh, the new build number to the old build number, and you're set. Right? If you have a problem, our goal is switch it back so that you don't have any uh, impacts to the customer, uh, and we'll figure out the next day if there's an, if there's, if there's an issue. Uh, but that's the quickest way. This job takes about around 15 seconds to run, um, you know, and we can do this with confidence. There's no, we, have, we haven't run into issues since that. Also, the verification. Uh, anytime you make a change and it goes through our CI, CI process, it will go in and send you this report and tell you which ones have passed, which ones have failed. Uh, and, so, so, and we get notified. So if anything's broken, uh, we know that this one's not going to deploy that night because somebody has checked in a change that's broken. This is very similar to somebody checking in a change uh, and you're having a compile issue or an FX cop issue or you know, things like that. So here's the whole picture, uh, what, we, what we spoke right now. And then I have two quick uh, demos, probably I'm going to uh, go down to one. But um, so the top row you can see is all our reporting, telemetry, uh, RBAC. So we have automation over there. Uh, we use authentication for active, with Active Directory and then have all these reports that we went through. <laughs> the middle row, which is the DIY maintenance, that helped us get to the, the blue section down here, which is the IAP, uh, our whole IAP packaging and CI process. If we had not done that, we probably didn't, would not have had the bandwidth to actually do this process. So that was really important, and that's being used till uh, today. People use these jobs to just go out there and turn their pools on and off, uh, do their cert maintenance. That's never going to go away, uh, syncing and stuff like that. Uh, and if you see down here, um, the, whole, the whole pipeline or the, the whole CI process is down here. Uh, those are the prod devices, which, has, which are taking live traffic. Those have to be up at all time, and each of them are an HA pair. And we have dev, QA, and then uh, pre-prod, pre and then prod. Uh, so what happens is that if you need to make a change, you need to add a server to a pool, you need to remove a server from the pool, simple stuff like that. The teams, them, any team, we host the endpoints for all the teams in the company. Um, you can go out there to your do-it-yourself box, make that change. You have your Jenkins job, which I just showed. I'm going to do a live demo, uh, a recorded demo, actually, will show you about how this thing is done. Uh, get the Jenkins job to check it into uh, Subversion and Git. It gets checked in. The Jenkins does the CI, CS, and DSM, DS, DS being a daily stable build. Uh, that gets checked into Artifactory. And this process, un up till now, is very similar for any, any of our artifacts, be it .NET, Java. Uh, I think we do it even for Assembler and, and COBOL, some of the legacy products out there, uh, where we, we build a, a test. Uh, and then go forward. But with the big IP, as you can see, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy journey to reach here, 
But after the Jenkins build this, it goes to Artifactory, it's staged. We know the version that needs to get deployed. It's, it's, it gets pushed again back to the verify out here, and you see that report, that's the, that's the last report I showed you over here. Um, and then it sits there, right? Now you can deploy it tonight, you can deploy it tomorrow night, you can deploy it whenever, because you know the, the version out there is good. Um, and then during the window, you go out there and you say, I need to push out all these changes, pick the right build number for your application, and with this job right here, you know, just select the right products that need to go out, make the change, have the customer validate it, you know, and, uh, and you're set. So, show you a quick demo. It's a four minute demo on, the, on this side, and then we'll move on to the next one. As Brendan talked through their big IP tool that they use, uh, he touched a little bit on StatHub as a telemetry tool. Um, here's another picture of it for reporting on that. A few little bullet points here. <clears throat> it's our homegrown tool, centralized monitoring, logs, activities, traces, host statistics like CPU, RAM, disk, anything like that, transactions per second. Uh, it's supported primarily with the Elastic Stack and RabbitMQ. So you've got publishers from other uh, products in the company that push their stuff into Rabbit. We've got a homegrown tool called our collector that pulls stuff off Rabbit and puts it in Elasticsearch. We have a couple other tools like our portal, we call it, and that's where you get this view from. There's some custom reports there, so you can view your kind of data. People have it up all around the company, sometimes on TV, so that they can see what's going on up to the minute, stuff like that. So it's really kind of an important tool for the company, centralized way of logging, uh, consistent that way. I'm not going to dive as much into the details of StatHub, per se, as Brendan did with the Big IP stuff. I'm just going to focus more kind of on our CI, CD pipeline, how we go about doing this kind of stuff, some of the problems that we face with our deployments, where we've kind of been with that, where we are now, and, and where we're heading with it. <clears throat> so we've got a developer checking in his code here. It goes down two paths. There's the CI and the CS. The CS is the continuous stable. So that's going to use any of the dependencies that we pull in, like a framework kind of thing, a centralized code base for everyone to use at CSG. That's going to pull in the stable thing that was built the day before. The continuous integration one is going to pull in the latest dependencies. So if, for example, there's a framework change today, like right now, it's going to kick off the CI build just like it would if we kick off our code. So it's all about really like fast feedback, like that bottom loop is right there. And as we move along with the CS, when it finishes there, we run some smoke tests. Those are a little bit more involved, longer running things. The CI is going to run our unit tests. Those are going to be you know, your quicker things. Just get a really fast idea. Did it build? Does it pass these tests? And we actually deploy on the test box itself there where it's doing the CI. And we run through some acceptance tests. And as long as all that stuff passes, then we do our DSM build. We push all of our MSIs up to Artifactory, central repository, so that we can pull that down from anywhere and run other tests and deploy that. Um, and the DSM actually is using the, the stable dependencies as opposed to the latest stuff. And then as a last step, it deploys to a QA environment, and then we can manually log in there. Our QA testers can or developers can, and immediately start working with it and doing kind of manual tests as they need to. Um, <clears throat> so we've got this CC tray that Brendan kind of touched on as well. This really kind of gives us fast feedback also. It tells us right away if, if that build process was successful or if it failed or where it failed along the, along the way. And we can dive into any one of those and look at the build history and we can see that it's been successful or if it's failed, how long has it been failing for, uh, when did it start failing, what commit caused that. And we can dive into that too and figure out what the problem actually was. So it's a really helpful tool for us there. Um, it's really simple. Green is good, red is bad. Um, we get email notifications right away too, so we're alerted to it if we're not paying attention to that tool. <coughs> um, our whole ecosystem, I guess, of, of everything that we've got, our Elasticsearch, Rabbit, our portal, UI, Collector, all these different things that we have has grown a lot just since I got here. I started here like the last day of January, so I'm still relatively new. Um, learning this stuff. But you can see we've gone from 10 Elasticsearch nodes to 16 and very soon here it's going to be 21. We have to continually size that stuff because we get more and more traffic coming in, more and more products start sending their stuff to StatHub. Um, we've started doing the blue-green stuff 
<clears throat> down here too for our rabbit and collector and Brendan kind of touched on that as well. We use Big IP for that too and we use the DIY job for that so that works really great for us. We can just submit our own thing, say okay let's flip over, we're having some kind of problem here, let's flip over or we want to do maintenance on these two servers, let's flip over to the other one and we can flip back. So that's worked really well for us but clearly we're expanding fast so that, that's a problem as far as deployments are concerned. So as far as a start to finish kind of deployment, if we're gonna if we're gonna scale out and we need a new machine to add a new collector or a new portal or something like that, what does that look like? Well the first thing is we have to request a VM and then we sit there and we wait and we wait and we wait. And that's one of the first problems that I wanted to address there. Once we finally get it, <clears throat> it only has the OS on it. Maybe a few other kind of things for SAs to, to monitor some stuff, but nothing that we need for our products. So then we have to go manually install and configure any sort of prerequisite things like that. So for Portal, we need IIS on that already. So we'd have to go and install IIS on every one of these servers, make sure it's configured properly, make sure you go through this checklist of things and make sure you don't mess anything up or forget it because that's always fun to recover from. Um, and then we have to go and manually run the deployment process. Then we actually say, okay, let's go to Artifactory, let's get Portal and let's install it. So it's ready to go. And once that's done, then we have to go in, in some cases, and do some more manual configuration for our collectors, for example, since we host more than one on a machine. And I'll get into that a little bit here later. So the question is, how can we improve that? You know, we're seeing I highlighted stuff in orange here as kind of a hint to see that those are kind of our two pain points there, right? There's a lot of waiting on the front end, and then there's a lot of manual stuff that we need to do. And that only gets worse as we expand. So the way we were doing this is we were using Blade Logic website to do this. For those of you not familiar with Blade Logic, it's just kind of an automation deployment tool. You can set up jobs to run manually, you can set it up to batch things, or do it on a schedule, anything like that. Um, <clears throat> but the process we have to go through there is, of course, we have to wait and make sure the VM is ready for us, manually install all that stuff, manually select one server at a time to go install updates to or to, to deploy to start with, manually and select one app at a time, one instance of collector, one instance of portal, whatever that may be, and then go and manually apply all those custom configurations if needed to. It's a time-consuming, painful process, as you can imagine. Um, here's an example of the website. You can see, you know, a whole bunch of our different servers here. You can de deploy, you could do an individual one if you want to. <clears throat> you click on that deploy, you get another screen here. And this is a really trimmed down list. This is better than what it used to be at this point, as was pointed out to me. It used to be really confusing and error prone because you'd have tons of them there. And if you only want to do collector, you better make darn sure you're just clicking the, the MSIs for collector. And then you got to specify the release and version and build for every one of those guys. And finally, you can submit the job and it goes off and it does it. But remember, that's only the one piece of the puzzle. There's still more configuration you have to do afterwards. <clears throat> so what we're doing now to try to improve this is we're using an autopilot Jenkins job. So again, we've got VM that has to be provided. <clears throat> Still have to do the prerequisite kind of stuff. But you can see I highlighted in orange there, I don't know if you can see it or not, kind of the difference here of how this has improved. So now instead of just selecting one server, we can select one or many at the same time to deploy to. Same thing goes for our app. So if we want to deploy all those collectors or all those portals to all these different servers at the same time, we've got the flexibility to do that. So that's been a helpful thing for us. Here's what that page looks like, kind of a do-it-yourself type of thing again. Go through, select your environment, whether that's our prod environment, our pre, our QA, dev, whatever that might be. <clears throat> you can choose your artifact, which would be your collector, portal, UI, whatever apps that we have there. Uh, the build number and which server you want to install to. A couple notes here that are conveniences here as well. If we leave that artifact blank, instead of having collector, just nothing there, it'll do all the things. So you get some flexibility there and the same thing for target, it'll do all of them. So really, it provides a lot of flexibility over what we had, but it still doesn't get us really to where we want to be. It's better though, so that's good, it's progress. So chef to the rescue. Brendan kind of mentioned this stuff a little bit. Um, when I first started here, I hadn't done anything with Chef, and most of the people on our team had really limited knowledge to it. And we had set a goal in six months, we wanted to be really automated with Chef stuff, and I thought, yeah, right, as busy as we are with everything else. But we've come so far, so fast, and it's really not that hard. You just kind of have to dive in and get going with it and embrace it as a culture. So with Chef, 
We have cookbooks for those of you not familiar with it. We have recipes within there and there's attributes. <clears throat> so we can do installation and configuration in a repeatable way this way with scripting. And we can set it up ahead of time and have separate attribute files for each of our environments. So when you run this thing, you specify and say, okay, I want to run this for prod. You've got all the things just for prod there. You want to run it for pre, all the things just for pre are there. It's all configured. It's all um, infrastructure as code kind of stuff. I guess you could say it's all checked in so we can always see what's going on and what has changed. The cookbooks can be reused, which is really nice too. So remember the part I said before about having to do those prerequisite steps and install IIS? This eliminates that now. So we can have a cookbook that will install IIS and do all the configuration that we need. And then we just specify it in a run list for our web server, which I'm going to touch on next. And we can reuse it for different apps like Portal and UI and be guaranteed no steps are going to be missed. It's always going to be set up the right way. And if we decide, oh, crap, the setting is wrong, we just change it in this one place and run through it again. Another nice thing here is that Chef can be automated in many ways. So we can kick that off with Blade Logic. And we do that right now. We can still run that. <clears throat> it's not ideal, but we can do it. Um, the Terraform, I don't know who's any of you are familiar with Terraform. Really sweet tool. We've started a, a project to move some of our stuff into AWS in the cloud. I'll touch on that in just a little bit here too. But that Terraform allows us to basically spin up and tear down uh, VMs in AWS. And as part of that, we can kick off chef scripts as well. So we basically provision the machines kick off the chef scripts and you're done. It's all ready to go there, everything you need to do. And the last thing is Chef Automate. And that's really kind of the, the direction we want to get to. And as a company, as a culture, we've decided that's, that's what we're, we're working toward. And, and I think we're going to get there pretty soon. We're not quite on that beta list yet, but pretty soon, I think. Um, so here's an example of a top level cookbook for a web server, for example. We have to install a statistic agent command and control service, our portal and our UI. And you can see with portal and UI, they've got these other prerequisite things that have to be set up as well. And it does all that for you automatically. Just kick it off. It's not manual anymore. Um, like I said, is that whole manually step eliminated by Chef? Pretty much. It's really close at this point, but something still has to kick it off like that. Someone still has to go push a button. Well, that's where Chef Automate comes into play here. And that eliminates that for you, and it automates it and does it for you. So we can come through, and we can set up an environment <coughs> file here and a server file here and tie them together. We can say for this environment, we want these cookbooks with these versions, and we want these servers to be tied to that environment. So every server here that we provision is going to fit this environment like that. That's all committed to source control. Chef Automate orchestrates everything for you. You can set it on a 30-minute cycle, whatever the, the, that might be, and it's just going to go through and do it. So when you want to make a change like this, you come in here and say, OK, I want to use the EPC server version 1745 now, or whatever that might be, right? Update that, commit it, goes into Chef Server. Chef Automate picks that up, and it says, oh, this is supposed to be here. Let's check. It's my 30-minute window now. What's out there right now? Well, it's 1740, but this says I should be 175 and it reconciles it for you. So that's, that's kind of the holy grail of where we're trying to get to uh, with respect to that. So that was the manually part. Um, what about the waiting? <clears throat> so for new VMs, when we're on-prem like we are right now, it's a manual slow process. We have to wait for the platform team, for the system admins, and they've all got their own priorities and their own projects that they're working on too. And that's understandable, we have the same thing. Uh, so that's out of our control. So what do we do about it? Well, we can sit and complain about it or we can come up with another way to solve that problem. So the cloud is kind of the way that we're exploring that right now. Like I said, we've started and gone through two POCs on moving StatHub to AWS. And both of those have gone really well so far. Um, it's super fast. We can spin up and down our environment, our whole, basically our whole environment in like 10, 15 minutes, something like that, and tear it down. So when you're coding something out, if there's something wrong with it, you only burned like 15 minutes and you run it again. And that's for, you know, 20, 30 servers, whatever it might be, not just one. A lot of benefit there. It's all scriptable, Terraform and Chef, fast feedback. And, and once we get there, we can scale at will. Like I said, a lot, uh, our whole uh, ecosystem is expanding really fast. And we need to scale to fit all the demand of the new data that comes in. This, this allows us to do that. 
As far as failover and disaster recovery, <clears throat> on-prem right now, the DIY job from Big IP that Brendan talked about has been great for us for our blue-green stuff. It's really, really helped a lot when we've been in trouble and been behind, uh, with our rabbit especially. <clears throat> DR is still kind of an involved process. We just went through an exercise recently company-wide to do that. Uh, we got it done, we passed, but it took a while, a couple days on that. Um, if we can make our way to the cloud, to AWS, this gets a lot more simple, right? Whether it's the DIY job or committing code here for uh, the load balancer to fail over blue-green is, you know, it's, it's not much difference there. But as far as disaster recovery with our Terraform scripts, the way that we've set this up, we literally can change a variable from using US West 2 region to using US East 1 region and rerun it again and we'll stand up exactly the same environment in a whole other region. So if there happens to be a problem out in Oregon, we go to Virginia and we're good to go. I mean, we update uh, our load balancer and say, point here now or update a DNS to go to, to that new load balancer and, and that's it. So it's a really, really good process there. So we're super excited about that. Um, and that is my presentation. So. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat>